Hey friends, it's your pal Mike Shea from Sly Flourish here with another episode of Sly Flourish's Lazy DM Prep. In this weekly show, we go through steps from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master while preparing for my Sunday D&D game. In this case, I am running the finale of Rime of the Frostmaid in the hardcover adventure Rime of the Frostmaid by Wizards of the Coast. If you enjoy this show, you can help me out by becoming a patron of Sly Flourish. Patrons of Sly Flourish help support shows like this. They get access to all kinds of exclusive material. They get access to a independent Discord channel, all kinds of great stuff. So if you like what you're seeing, please join the Sly Flourish Patreon. Last week was a great big event really cool i think it's a little unfortunate that the way this campaign is going to end is with two days two sessions that are almost all exclusively big ass fights on the other hand people like to watch their characters do cool stuff so in the last session the characters were preparing to meet with two groups the knight's kiss and avarice the mage of the arcane brotherhood they kind of set themselves up they sort of prepared things it was a really cool opportunity for them to kind of get in position, figure out what they were going to do and try to get the drop on them. And the neat thing, when, when you offer the players an opportunity to sort of prepare for a battle like that, the neat thing is you can make the battle really hard because the, the characters are going to have such an advantage by like readying, readying actions or setting up traps or getting them in the right position and stuff like that. So in this case, it was a lot of dudes. It was like a bunch of regular drow, I think four or six regular drow house soldiers. And then I had the two members of the Knight's Kiss. And then I had two gargoyles. And then I had Avarice herself, right? And so it was a lot of monsters for them to fight. And that battle wasn't really hard. The The Knight's Kiss were really bad. They were, they, they hit hard and they damaged people. I used the shadow, the drow shadow blade and the drow assassin were too. The drow assassin never really got off much of anything. I think she did do some damage, one, some poison damage. And that was, that was pretty cool. But the drow shadow blade hit somebody really hard because drow shadow blades hit really hard. So she did a lot of really cool things, but they managed to kill the two members of the night. They killed one member of the night's kiss. The other member of the night's kiss caught a glimpse of shadow Hawk's true mind flayer self and couldn't handle it. And she screamed and ran and we have not, we will never see her again. She fled and she's giving up her ways and who knows she will now be, you know, she will now be something else. But that, that was the end of her. So one of the members of the Night's Kiss ended up getting away, which I think is okay. When you get at the end of a campaign, having loose threads at the end, I think is okay. You don't have to tie up every single loose thread. It's fun to have things out there that the characters, the players can imagine. Oh, I wonder what happened to her, right? That's, that's, it's all right. That's how life works, right? That came out. And, and then what happened is then they defeated Avarice. And it was pretty cool that they kind of defeated Avarice close to the end, that they, they, they defeated Avarice close to the end of the fight, her gargoyles were destroyed, and when she died, they could see like that she has like an icy skeleton underneath. Like they hit her with stuff, and her face would burn, and part of the skeleton would be there. And they're like, "Why is her skeleton blue?" And then she showed her true form, which is that she is the physical manifestation carrying. She is carrying the physical manifestation of Oral. And at that point, they faced all three versions of Oral, one right after the other, and it was hard and challenging and long it took the full three hours to do it but at the end they had done it and it was i think i don't think they were disappointed with the challenge but boy the versions of oral went down in some cases in half of a round because they just don't have a lot of hit points and they have vulnerabilities so like you hit one with fire and it's only got 110 hit points and they're level nine right so they really knocked down the level the 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 the, the very the three forms of oral really quickly and that kind of ended oral's influence over this thing they also then acquired the keys to get into the central spire which can take them to thrun's to thrun's chamber and that is where uh the game ended so we've got some big work to do today because today we are going to do the final session. So let's go to Rhyme of the Frostman, generate a session planning template. The last one. Last one for this game, probably. And it is 19... 19 December, Sunday, Frostmaiden. We are going, it's important for us to review the characters and the particular question we're going to ask ourselves is what has to, how, what do we want to make sure we're dropping in here that makes their character, kind of concludes their character. We're definitely going to be doing like a montage, right? I think, 
although I think the way the scenes are going to work out, we're going to see how that goes. But I want to make sure that like the main arcs for the characters are covered so that the players feel like they got what they got, right? And it doesn't mean everything is resolved because we talked about that. But it means that we just want to make sure we're tugging on all the all the different characters, right? So we know Ilda has so Ilda, Auken, and Candle now all have sort of direct connections to the blood of Thrun, the the blood of an elder evil, and I think that one of them is probably going to have to make one or more of them are going to have to make some kind of sacrifice to truly seal up the sarcophagus of Thrun, stop the energy that's pouring out there, stop the the Mithalar, and. You know, they're, they're, they're going to have to make a big choice, and we're going to have to figure out what that choice is. Gore has to be infected by something. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, like, you know, the, the, I don't know that Gore, like, Ilda, I feel like, has a definite big arc that has to sort of be concluded here. And I'm, I'm not sure exactly what that is, right? Auken probably, but not quite as strong, because his connection to Thrun is something that happened later, where Ilda has been a, a major arc of hers for, for, for everybody. Shadowhawk, I'm thinking that Shadowhawk sometime during this fight, I think it's time for him to turn into a true mind flayer. I don't know what ability I'm going to give him, but I want to give him like one new ability that he can do and his form probably like fly or levitate, right? I think that that will be, that will be fun. You know, Gore, I don't know. Perrin, I'm not sure. So Perrin's big arc is that he, he, he kind of wants to join his brother and get on the Ascendant and, and take off and go into the Astral Sea. And I think that'd be a fun way to end. And that brings up the question, like, do we need to do the time travel thing, Right. I, I think it could be really cool and it'd be fun. And I want to drop it in as an option, but I don't know how that's going to work out. So that's something, these are like, you know, we should, we should be taking notes, right? I'm going to do this. We'll do a new section, major questions to answer. And we're going to do a checklist for this because I want to check them off. So how can we draw on Ilda's connection to throne? That's one what mind flare stuff can we give to Shadowhawk? Does he go full mind flare, or does it stay like that weird ethereal mind flare? I'm not sure. How do we incorporate the time travel aspect? How do we give players the choice and right level of motivation? to choose whether to go back or to stay, right? This is tricky. Anything else, what, what, what has to happen, right? What has to happen, right? This is the final battle, so it's important. Let me get my thoughts out, right? So what has to happen? They have to seal Thrun's sarcophagus, defeat Father Lymic. We know we want that. We want... It, does something have to happen with each of the characters? I don't know. Like, I, I think the players can kind of bring, you know, can, can, can kind of bring that up. What else has to happen? They have to end the Endless Night. I think we have to have some kind of personal sacrifice and figure out what that is, right? Is there anything else that absolutely, that we really want to make sure happens with this campaign? Our Oral's influence is done. We don't have to have anything with that. We, you know, what's something we could do? We could have sort of the, you know, oh, so this would be a great strong start, right? The coming of Malar, Burley, and Talos. How about as a strong start? You want a strong start to a final conclusion? Three gods show up. Come to collect the remains of Oral and bring her back to the Pantheon. I think that that would be kind of cool. Right, bring her at least bring her remains <clears throat> back to the pantheon, right? So Malar would be like this sort of what tiger, the huge tiger headed guy, you know, Umberly is this like woman swimming with you know water under her skin, and Talos, this right, well, let's look up Talos. What would Talos look like? Dark side of nature, so he, look at this cool helm, right. God of storms, forest fires, earthquakes, tornadoes, general destruction. Is it like evil druid? Is that what he would look like? Tell us portrayed as a broad-shouldered, bearded young man with a single good eye, the other covered by a dark patch. Perfect. Said to carry a collection of three staves made from the first cut tree of the world, the first silver melted, and the first iron forged. He uses these staffs to raise destructive ones. I'm going to make that one staff that's kind of wrapped with different things. 
So that's a good one. I think that will be a really fun, strong start. I like that. I think that is a fun beginning conclusion. Do they describe which how she appears? Not really. So that would be cool. So, yeah, I don't see anything that shows me what Umberly looks like. How about Malar? Kind of a lycanthropy. Uh, they're probably more like a lion-headed guy, right? I think that would be pretty cool. So I like the idea that Malar, Umberly, and, and, and Talos come to collect the remains of Oral and bring her remains back to the Pantheon. They ignore the characters. The voice of Thrun says, come. I think that that would be pretty cool. So I think I, mean, I think that kind of gets us a start. So what's what's this going to look like? So the coming of the gods, right? Then the en entering the spire, and I think we're gonna because so so here's here's another little you know tip, which is I think I've got all of the players coming today, which means I could have gone another session or two of them exploring the spire, added stuff if I only had like four, but because I have them all, we're cutting that and we're gonna go straight in. You know, you're going to see this, you know, kind of the, the remnants on the walls, but pretty much you're going to uh, get on a, you're going to get on a ship, you're going to get on an elevator and go down to the, to the lowest, to the lowest levels. You know, I think that that's, I, I think that that is what we're going to do. So we're going to skip, they enter the spire, huge Netherese elevator that takes them down to the to the to the to the the crypt right was that a crypt the sepulcher the sepulcher of thrun they are fully rested 10th level characters right which means i want to run probably a three phase fight against them i'm going to give them the equivalent of three fights back to back no rest in between and 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 so i talked on the talk show before about not worrying about rests and not worrying about attrition boss fights you want to worry about stuff like that because it's a boss fight and you want to make sure it's a challenge so you want to have a lot of stuff going on right and that's that's what we're going to spend most of today most of this session thinking about is how that's going to work are there any secrets there are some secrets we don't have to worry about secrets too much because like these are the end this is the end right so what are some of the secrets the 3 gods through oral out from the pan out from the pantheon they probably feel bad about it now so i think that that is i think that that's good what else the netherese tried to build a time time travel it's a time safeguard that could roll back roll back time before any disaster it never was used father limac was the founding member of the knights of the black sword he chose to stay with the sarcophagus of thrun when the netherese took it father limac was corrupted by thrun's influence after the crash so what does Father Limac want? Uh, Father Limac wants Thrun released to turn into the realm, into Thrun's new homeworld. He's just kind of a nutty villain, right? What else? I mean, you know, Thrun and Father Limac are kind of irredeemable things. Father Limac believes that Ilda or Aachen could be the one to open the, sarc the sarcophagus of Thrun. I, of course, believe they don't want to. They all are also, their blood can either open or close the sarcophagus, but at the cost of their lives. Many others tried and failed. They have become the handmaidens of Thrun. What is a handmaiden of Thrun? I think a handmaiden of Thrun is a shambling mound. I think I'm, I'm going to reskin the shambling mound, right? These are good, meaty creatures. They hit twice. They do 13 damage on a hit. They have good range. 
They can engulf, blind, and restrain. They have this lightning absorption. We could change that. Re they resist fire and lightning. They have no vulnerabilities. They're really good ones. So we're gonna we're gonna reskin shambling mounds into handmaids in the through. What what about Loth? Uh, what are they called? Yoklo. Let's just take a look at Yoklo and see if they're how they do. They're CR ten. It's probably more than I need. So I think like, you know, the, the good the good thing about shambling mounds is that they're simple, but they're powerful, right? Shambling mounds are simple, but powerful. So we are going to, let's make an encounter. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna think about the monsters that are gonna be in this encounter. We're gonna stick in one, one encounter for the whole game. And it's probably gonna take most of the session. It's a couple hours of the session, I think, at least. Father Lymic and friends, right? And we have, so we have a shambling mound. Uh, I think we decided last week, and we did a little vote on this, and it was really close. But I think we decided last week to use the uh, lichen, the lichen lich, as a Father Limac substitute. So I think that that will work. Is there what? What is another? Okay, and and so we're gonna we're gonna play around with a we're gonna play around with something else too that I want to do. So I have that manage characters. I think we've got these are all the characters that are in there. Uh, I don't have to worry about their level too much because I'm not worried about challenge training. So oh, and how many how many shambling mouse? Four, six. We'll start with four. So here's the. Here's some of the fun. So here's here's a, an idea that I'm considering, which is which I'm calling lightning rods. And the idea of lightning rods is we can look at each of the characters, and we'll we'll do that we'll do that right now. My campaigns, Sunday D and D. We're gonna look at them mechanically. Oh, I'm missing somebody. Oh, because Shadow, Shadowhawk, yeah, Shadowhawk plays with a manual one. So we look at them mechanically. Right. And we know that and we think about what they're really good at. And we want to make sure that they get to do fun things that they're good at. Right. And mostly in the area of like saver suck control. The only one who's got real good saver suck control is Perrin. He's the only one that does it. But Gore is certainly known to Gore's thing is I think he'll banish, but he also does blink. It would be really interesting to kind of dick with blink you don't want him to not blink right you don't want to take it away you don't you're not looking to take away cool abilities that they do but you also want to kind of make things interesting and a way to do that is to have like hordes of stuff which could be fun like could it be skeleton i mean could we do something as, as kind of interesting as like 50 skeletons could we throw a horde of skeletons in here what would what would be like if you're in thrun's sarcophagus I think it's kind of cool that there'd be like hundreds of dead corpses all around the outer edge of the room, right? Like bodies that have been there for, for a long time since the crash. And since then, like people that went down here to try to deal with it and failed. Okay, how'd they get down here though? I don't know. The remnants of the Knights of the Black Sword could be good. You could have a bunch of wraiths, right? It would make sense to have black sword wraiths. We have these sword wraiths. Let's take a look at sword wraiths, right? Knights of the Black Sword. They, they, the problem is they hit for so little. Look at this. They're like, how is that a CR three and they do eight damage? It's weak. These are weird ones. As a bonus action, the sword wraith can make a one weapon attack. If it does so, they attack against it. Have it attack worlds against it. It's so weird. We might just go with normal wraiths because they're they're pretty nasty. They're CR five too. Low hit points. And they only hit once for 21 necrotic, but they can drain your life for that. So those wraiths could be could be fun, right? I might throw some wraiths in there. Where am I encounter? And I think I like regular wraiths more than like sword wraiths. Sword sword wraiths are so weak, right? CR3, come on. I'd rather have a white, you know? You could have so we could do whites. And you know, if we didn't want to be as nasty as wraiths, let's let's take a look here. Where's my Where's my encounter I just created? Did I lose it? Did I not save it? Is it my Tiamat shows up one? We can delete that one. And my Eat Orcus one. We can get rid of that one. I guess it didn't work. Okay, so we'll do it again. I wonder if it doesn't like ampersands. I don't know. Something, every so often, weird stuff happens in here. I manage the characters, got the right characters. I don't think I saved it. So we have the Lichen Lich. We have Shambling Mounds. 
Do we want to have another great big thing to worry about? And we're going to have wraiths, right? We said we're going to have like four shambling mounds. We could have like six wraiths. That might be, this is going to be really hard. Is there a cool big thing? I don't think I clicked this save. So we're going to click save. So then I've got it. And then I can go edit again. And that way it won't go away. Is there another... So you can have this idea. I like I like the idea of a banished buddy, right? And a banished buddy is like a great big, a great big thing that you clearly want to crowd control, right? You clearly want some way to ensure that it can't get anywhere, either through banish or entangle or something. And if it hits, it hits like a freight train. And a good example would be a fire, right? Fire giants are really good big nasty high armor class high hit point plus 11 20 like they're just monstrously brutal right and you add that in and that is your oh a star spawn hulk good idea let's take a look at that star spawn hulk right 16 multi-attack it's funny that it hits for less than a fire giant does the psychic damage roping reaping arms yeah, this one's pretty good. I think, yeah, we, we I like that. That's a good one. So we're going to add that guy, and we're going to get rid of the fire giant. So that one's cool. And maybe it's the kind of thing where Father Limac pulls it out of the other world, right? And so it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of the physical, you know, it's another sort of creature pulled from the same world that the Elder Evil was pulled from. I think that's a good one. And that could be part of, if we think about the multi-phase fight. So one thing is we don't want to drop Father Limac in right away. So I think they'll go down there. What are the waves, right? If we, if we, if we look at these, what are the waves we want to have? What, what's fighting with Father Limac? When does Father Limac show? When do these other things show up? What's the order that this happens in? He should probably not show up till phase two, right? And maybe he can sort of redirect... Wow, what happened there? Report feedback. It ain't working. How's that for feedback? What happened to your thing? Hey, at least this time it... Why did it keep their initiative? I guess it pulled it from the game log because I rolled it earlier. Interesting. Look at this. Failing. This is bad news. I guess we'll look it up in another. He's a good one. 225 hit points. So he, he's not going to show up till the... So, so what are the phases of this fight, right? Is a big. This is a big question. How do we how do we arrange how do we arrange the fight? Does it start off with the you know with the you know the, the, is Father Limac there but he's untouchable? I I, I think I kind of like the idea that Father Limac can sort of you know separate. I don't know. I, I, I'm like is he just standing there and they're like, well, I shoot him in the face and now you're fighting him plus all, everything else. Does he have a way to sort of protect himself that you have to break through, but the only way to break through it is getting rid of his minions? You know, what's, what's, you know, is he fighting them? How does this, how does this battle play out, right? Is, is there a form of him that they can't damage yet? I think like he probably shows up. I like, I like this image of him, right? Like this, this is a cool looking version of him when he actually forms right but i think i think at first a phase let's 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 go down to monsters right and we'll have like phase one is what wraiths phase two is phase two is shambling mounds and the hulk and phase three is father limac and it doesn't necessarily need to be like they're they're you know they can they can stagger over one another so that he can sort of show up in the middle of the other ones. But the idea is like they they're kind of like handling these things differently. Are six wraiths enough? And then four shambling mounds plus a star spawn hulk. We'll see how they do too. Maybe I throw two star spawn hulks in there and they've got they got lots of problems to deal with. And then Father Limac, right? You know, and I think like I'm gonna end up. I'm going to end up improvising some of this as we go too, but I'd like to at least know where it's going to start. Right. And I think the idea of like father Limac in a spectral form, plus these like wraith like forms of the uh, Knights of the, the black sword. I think that that could be pretty cool. 
maybe eight is better than six because uh, so what's the CR just for just for funsies? They are six tenth level characters, so that's sixty. So thirty CRs is is considered a deadly fight. So that's six wraiths because they're CR five. So six of them would be considered deadly. Eight would be higher, but I don't think they're as deadly as that because they they're pretty low on hit points. You know, they're pretty they're pretty low on hit points. Uh, the Shambling Mounds of Star Spawn Hulk, that's definitely because they're they're CR five, so that's twenty, and then he's ten, so that's thirty, and then Father Limac is twenty something. So yeah, pretty hard. And you know, I could throw an eight and see right. And these are night the the former you know former knights of the Black Sword. The Shambling Mounds of Star Spawn Hulk are horrors from the other side. And then, of course, Father Limac is Father Limac. So I think that that works. NPCs. I like the idea of the animated, the, the brain in the jar with the animated armor. All right. That's, it's kind of in the book. And let's, let's take a look. Yeah. I think that might be like a fun sort of caretaker of this place. I'll go to Sources, Adventures, Icewind Dale, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. So Devious Alpha says you can make the number of race significant. Yeah, I think like eight eight feels right because it's like that. How many Knights of the Black Sword were down here protecting this thing? And, it, and eight or nine makes sense, right? There were nine members, including Father Limac plus the eight others. And those are the wraiths. And they continue to serve. They've been corrupted too, but they died. And then were reincarnated as these wraiths. And they, and they sort of protected and they, you know, it goes there. What was I looking up? I was looking up something. Oh, yeah. The Etherin. And the central spire is Y19. And in Y19 is this person, uh, Veneranda. So I think Veneranda is a former member of former Netherese Archmage. Now a brain in a jar top a helmed horror. And what's her, does she have a motivation? Now she now kind of serves as caretaker to the spire, recognizes the corruption and doesn't approve. You know, looked down upon Father Limac forever and doesn't mind seeing him fall and knows about the safe, the safety, the safeguard. That'd be kind of a fun NPC, I think. Let's make a card. So I have a picture. We now have an NPC. And we can steal this whole text and put it in here. Just so we have it handy. Cool. Are there any... What are the environmental effects going on in this chamber? Is there... So they can channel... So let's see. what The, the chamber itself... Right, this look, this uh, has a huge spinning obelisk, a mythalar, floating above the sarcophagus. Energy, you know, black energy flowing up from the sarcophagus to the mythalar, which in turn is sending it up through the spire to the endless night. So that is there. There is a tear in reality arcing to the tear in reality arcing to the Mithalar that shows both the world of Thrun, which sucks, and a temperate version of Icewind Dale, which is. Icewind Dale from greater than 2,000 years ago, right? Is there any other kind of fun or interesting environmental effect that is that is occurring here? You know, possible like arcs of necrotic energy from the sarcophagus. But I don't know that I need to worry about that. Like, you know, I think the idea of like having interesting environmental effects, it's cool, but like, do you need it? I think fighting monsters is good on its own. More important is what needs to happen to end the endless night and seal Thrun's sarcophagus, All right? What, what's cool? So they need to end the spell using the codex, using the codicil of the white. It takes someone... It takes someone trained in religion to do so, but I think it's automatic. It takes an action to do so, but they can just do it. 
right? And that's they they knew that. But at that point, the energy of the sarcophagus is un is unchanneled and can tear open a rift to Thrun's world in the sky above Icewind Dale, right? So they need to, to then seal it. So I think Ilda or Aachen can seal the sarcophagus. I think Ilda Aachen can seal the sarcophagus, but doing so takes their life. They essentially become the new Knight of the Black Sword who must eternally guard the sarcophagus. One option is to return to the time before the elves drew in Thrun and prevent it. Doing so means a one-way trip back to Icewind Dale more than 2,000 years ago. Is that an option? Is that is that where the fun of is that where the fun of time travel can or is that too is that too weird? I don't know. And then are they really going back in time and fixing anything? Or are they just, you know, are they really fixing anything? Or are they just forking off an alternate universe? I don't know. You could also just get rid of the time travel thing. I don't is it cool? It feels kind of cool, but like I don't know. We don't have to worry about treasure. They just got a bunch of treasure. So we're not doing any more treasure today. And I don't really use the scratch pad anymore. So I don't think we need that either. So what's left? Let's go back to our checklist. So they have to seal through in sarcophagus. I think we've got zip zap says time travel feels like a hat on a hat. Interesting. I mean, I, I like the idea that it's an option and maybe, maybe it's just there, right? And they know they can do it. And then maybe they don't need to do it. Maybe it's just a, something they could do if they wanted to. Right? Maybe they don't have to go. Maybe we cut the hole back in time. Yeah, I don't. I don't know that that's that that's too bad. Is there anything else that I need for this? So I created an Albert Rodeo map. This is what it looks like. I guess uh, token stamp, and I've got my NPCs. I got my Father Limek. Save that to my desktop. And then choose an image. Uh, where is he? There he is. And I'll give him a cool border tint. Download that guy. And we have a Father Limac token. So I can now drag and drop him in here. And there he is, right? Father Limac. Probably standing up in the altar. Characters are probably gonna come in from the bottom. I think that will be cool. Is there a cool... That looks kind of cool. Go back to token stamp. I'll give it a green. Little green tint here. There we go. Download. Token stamp is fantastic for making tokens, by the way. I love I love me some token stamp. And this one is a Hulk of Thrun. Default size is two. He's a big he's a big fella. So now we've got those guys. Boom. Real nasty. Right? And then I think the Regular Wraith token is probably just fine. Maybe I'll make a slightly different one since I'm, since I'm here anyway. The green tint does not work. There we go. Go back to our Owlbear. And this is a Black Sword Wraith. So we got those guys and we're gonna have a bunch of them. I think they might be able to do like long ranged attacks too. We'll just do melee attacks that they can do from range. That's like an easy thing to do. So I think that's pretty good. I think I'm I think I'm happy with that. I don't I don't think things need to get too crazy. One thing is like if you want to make challenge, just more monsters, right? More monsters are easy. So I got my father Limec. He's up on the you know, he's up on the altar. We've got you know a few sword wraiths or a few of these black sword wraiths right around the chamber i think we decided about eight of them they're kind of spread out a couple close by and that that's sort of phase one i think that works where do we want to have a the rift you know the gateway i don't know where we're going to put that 
I don't know. We'll figure that out. So I think, you know, so how do I feel about it? And, you know, I guess a question for folks in chat. Do you feel like you got some good thoughts and good ideas about boss monster building? Like this is the final battle of a big, long campaign. I should probably take a look at the Lycan Lich and make sure that I understand all of the, all their abilities, right? So AC 20, good, strong AC, 225 hit points, decent amount of hit points, has legendary resistance, rejuvenation, doesn't matter, makes four attacks, poison touch, right? Plus nine to hit, reach 10 feet, 17 poison damage, target missing DC 19 to be poisoned for a minute. That's kind of cool. Wither, uh, let's see, make four attacks. I can do any of these. Uh, Wither is 60 foot. Necrotic damage, 14 damage. That's pretty good. Firestorm, that's pretty good. Big, crazy, you know, tear. Maybe we'll make this necrotic damage instead of fire damage. And it's like, the, it's the rift. Like the firestorm is I'm creating the rift. Can attack as a legendary. That's fine. Spellcasting, I don't think we'll worry about any of these. One poison creature can see, can fail, falls unconscious. I don't think we're going to bother with that. Sap life, I don't think we're going to bother with that. So uh, Solicia says, kind of, you decided three phases, threw in some monsters and called it a day. I think your boss fight forms during the session. Probably, and we, you know, I'll probably talk about like how it went later. Do I think about the dials differently at all when it comes to boss fights? Absolutely. Any additional dials, like summoning more allies? Maybe, like, that's where I'm like, you know, how many star spawn hulks am I going to summon? you know, maybe two instead of one, right? Like if they have a really easy time with the wraiths, I think maybe two of those might not be so bad, right? I think it, it will depend on how that second phase goes. But yeah, it's still the same dials, but I'll be paying a lot of attention to them during the fight. I think I'm good. So it is past 11. So I think we're going to see how it goes. So wish me luck. I'm hoping to hit all of the main things, main arcs. I'm hoping everybody is happy with it, with the game. And we're, I'm hoping to do my, my, you know, one year later, where are they? And we will see. So I want to thank everybody for coming today. I always appreciate it. And we will see you next week. We'll let you know how everything went. So have a great week and get out there and play some D&D. &D. Take care, everybody.